Hello gang, and welcome to the first lecture series for American History 2. This lecture series is based on chapter 15 in your textbook, Give Me Liberty by Dr. Eric Foner. This chapter is entitled, What is Freedom? Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. The first section is entitled, The Meaning of Freedom. The focus question for this section is, what visions of freedom did the former slaves and slaveholders pursue in the post-war South? African Americans' understanding of freedom was profoundly shaped by their experiences of slavery. Of course, the very most basic definition of freedom for African Americans at this time was the absence of slavery and their ability to escape the injustices of that system. Of course, it expanded, however, into ideas of sharing the rights and opportunities of American citizens in general. And, of course, the right to free travel and association, something that was severely limited under the slave regime. Family became an essential element of African American society and their conceptions of freedom in the post-war years. Efforts to locate missing family members were profound at this time, and many African Americans traveled hundreds if not thousands of miles trying to track down family members whom they were sold away from during the period of slavery. Uh, emancipation, however, also brought with it the idea of separate spheres for men and women, something that they adopted from white society at the time. Under the slave system, there really was no room for this idea of separate spheres as both African American men and women were subject to the whims of the system and their masters, and both sexes generally had very similar labor expectations, you know, with some minor variances based on gender, but overall, you know, especially for black men who were essentially powerless in the traditional manly role of the protector of family under the slave regime, that shifted after emancipation, and now African American men could take on that role as the protector and provider of their families, which helped to initiate this new separate spheres between men and women within the black community that mirrored those ideas of these separate spheres in the larger American community. Black's understanding of freedom was also intimately tied up with the institutions of church and school. During Reconstruction, we saw the rise of independent black churches as black congregations began to break away from the white church hierarchy and establish their own independent churches, something that was very empowering to the black community. Churches also housed schools, social events, and political gatherings for African Americans and really became a focal point of the African American community and the broader idea of freedom in general. Speaking of schools, there was a strong desire for education among African Americans at this time, something that was denied to them under the slave regime, and something that most African Americans at the time thought was essential for their ability to establish themselves in American society and indeed advance themselves in that society. All ages flocked to these new schools that were being established. This time also saw the creation of the nation's first black colleges, institutions of higher learning that blacks hope could bring African Americans up from slavery and into the wider social and economic milieu of American society.
Of course, ideas of political freedom became central to the broader African American conceptions of freedom in the after war years. The right to vote became central to this idea of political freedom among African Americans. And in the immediate after war period, political action abounded as African Americans demanded full citizenship, not just the abolition of slavery. African Americans' ideas of freedom also became directly related to land ownership, something that was adopted from the general American conception of freedom, going all the way back to that colonial period where owning a piece of land was the foundation for social, political, and economic freedom in America. Many African Americans insisted that through their unpaid labor as slaves, they had acquired a right to the land, a very powerful moral argument, but something that went against the general American ideas of private property and the sanctity of private property in the American legal system at the time. African American conceptions of freedom in the aftermath of the Civil War helped to shape the debate about the meaning of freedom in general in the United States during the period that became known as Reconstruction. Of course, the meaning of freedom also shifted for white Southerners in the period known as Reconstruction. Freedom for white Southerners in the antebellum period was intimately bound in with the institution of slavery, and many white Southerners viewed the ability to own the labor of another human being as foundational to their own independence and freedom. The loss of life and property caused by the Civil War in the South affected all classes of Southerners. Planter families in particular faced profound changes, including poverty and some having to perform physical labor for the first time in their lives, something that radically altered the social and economic paradigm and the very way that white Southerners thought about themselves. And and these changes called ma cause massive uh, amounts of anger and resentment among white Southerners in the Reconstruction period. Most planters define black freedom in the narrowest manner possible, and they did not think that economic autonomy or civil political equality actually applied to former slaves, that freedom for African Americans just meant freedom from slavery itself, no more and no less. The Republican North had its own version of freedom, and central to that version of freedom was the idea of free labor. And I want to make clear at this point what is meant by the term free labor. It is not free labor as in labor done for free, i.e. slavery. It is labor done by free people, free labor. And according to the Republican vision for a reconstructed South, if former slaves were free to labor as whites, they would be more productive and the Southern economy would flourish, leading to a free society resembling the North. This was the precise outcome that the Unionists in general hoped for uh, after the Civil War. A new government organization known as the Freedmen's Bureau was established in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, and this was really a grand experiment in government social policy, really the first of its kind in American history. The Bureau was tasked to establish schools, give aid to the poor and aged, solve disputes between whites and blacks, and ensure the equal treatment of former slaves and white unionists in the courts. The Bureau lasted from 1865 to 1870, and they had some effect and achieved some success in education and health care, but not so much in economic relations in the South. And 
one of these particular failures was in land reform. And this is tied in with the northern conception of freedom and its ties to the idea of free labor. That idea was promising in the South, but African Americans in general wanted land of their own. They wanted a, a, a piece of something to, to call their own, not just jobs for wages on plantations. And when the Freedmen's Bureau was set up, one of its missions was the redistribution of confiscated Confederate lands to former slaves. And I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase, 40 acres and a mule. This was something that African Americans believed they were not just promised, but entitled to in the aftermath of the Civil War as a result of their slavery experience. However, due to the inherent sanctity of private property in the United States legal system and the ideas of private property that were instilled in American society in general, those hopes of land redistribution were crushed as private property holders were able to consolidate and reaffirm their grip on their lands after the Civil War. And that meant the vast majority of rural free people remained poor and landless, and most remained in farm work, unskilled labor, and or domestic labor. Very few were actually able to acquire that piece of land that they believed was so integral to their very notion of freedom itself. Demise of the institution of slavery as a labor system in the South raised the question of exactly how the labor was going to work in the South moving forward particularly in agriculture, as, of course, the South was still primarily an agricultural-based economy that still required large amounts of labor, particularly in the large money-producing crops like rice, sugar, tobacco, and cotton. Well, in the rice-growing regions, particularly coastal South Carolina, the task system survived uh, under a new wage-type system. Uh, in the sugar-growing regions, particularly in Louisiana, the gang system, again, now transitioned into a wage labor system, uh, retained its hold in, in those regions. However, in many other regions, particularly those uh, of tobacco and cotton farming regions, sharecropping became the new norm as large landowners rented out small parcels of land to uh, former slaves and the idea was that the slaves would plant the crops and, and harvest the crops and then at the end of the season the crops were sold and the owners of the land and the actual labor laborers would split the profits. Now, ideally, of course, that was supposed to be a 50-50 split, but in reality, the landowners typically took most of the profits, leaving uh, often nothing more than a, a mere pittance to the sharecroppers themselves, barely enough to survive above a basic subsistence level. White farmers also faced substantial changes to their systems of labor in the aftermath of the Civil War. Losses during the war led to a new system known as the crop lien system, where farmers put up part of their crop, their harvest, as collateral on loans. These loans often came from local or regional merchants who would provide farmers with, with money at the beginning of the growing season with which they would buy seed and farm equipment with which to produce their crop. And once the crop was harvested and sold, they would then have to repay back that loan to their loan provider. Through this system, many farmers remain in a state of constant debt, especially due to ever-increasing interest rates and falling crop prices in the later decades of the 19th century.
and this led to many whites actually becoming sharecroppers as well. And sharecropping was certainly not isolated to black farmers. As a matter of fact, in the censuses of from the, pretty much the end of the Civil War through the, basically the first half of the 20th century, the majority of sharecroppers in the South were actually white farmers. During Reconstruction, southern cities experienced remarkable growth, in no small part thanks to the sheer amount of northern investment that came down into the south during this period from northerners who sought to take advantage of the devastation in the south to invest in rebuilding the south and of course hoping to profit from those investments. Uh, one particular feature of this was the remarkable spread of railroads in the south at the time. The railroad was integral to the success Success of the northern economy during the antebellum period, and northern investors sought to mimic that success by investing in the expansion of railroads in the south, which would further integrate the southern economy both regionally and nationally. This urban growth in the South during this period led to the rise of a new urban middle class, particularly businessmen and merchants involved in the whole reconstruction process in the afterwar years. During the antebellum period, the southern class system essentially was, was a three-part system. You had masters, slaves, and free human or white farmers who owned their own land and essentially were self-sufficient and independent. During the post-war period, these, this system changed and fractured and multiplied in multiple different ways where now you had landowners, black and white sharecroppers, white cotton farmers, black wage workers, and urban businessmen all sharing in this new social milieu in the southern areas of the United States. I'd like to wrap up this first section of this lecture with a bit of context on the aftermath of slavery in the United States in comparison to the aftermath of slavery in other areas, particularly in the Western Hemisphere during the 19th century um, that also abolished slavery. There were many parallels between the United States and other places in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, often you hear about the uniqueness of the American slavery and post-slavery experience. And that uniqueness has typically been overblown in the general historiography of the period. And really, when you compare the aftermath of slavery in the United States and in other areas, particularly in the Caribbean and Latin America, there were, were more similarities than there were differences. Most planters in all of these regions held very narrow views of black freedom and encouraged African Americans or, or uh, Afro-Caribbeans or uh, African Latinos, depending of course on which area you're referring to, to uh, retain employment on former plantation. Whereas former slaves tried to carve out as much independence as was possible in the societies in which they found themselves. Some planters in the United States, in the Caribbean, and Latin America tried to replace black slave labor with Chinese contract labor, which although was not technically slavery, in practice it was little different from the institution as it was known uh, prior to abolition. One area that the United States was unique in, however, is only in the United States did former slaves actually secure the right to vote. A very profound and important uniqueness of the United States and its uh, post-abolition uh, scenario.
that concludes the first section of our chapter 15 lecture series. As always, study hard, and I'll see you soon.